kids. It's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. Hiccups and cats pissing everywhere. Always fun. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, everyone? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Uh, early week episode, you know you know what everyone's here for, and that's reviews. And we're going to kick things off with uh, our friend Cole Martin joining the show. Cole, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Thank you. How are you? Eh. Eh. <laughs> it's, it's, better, it's better than... Eh. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, I- you take it. <laughs> I've had horrible heartburn for a few days. Wrestling's paused because I have to do this. I've been sleeping <laughs> terribly. My cat just pissed on the floor. It's it's one of those days. <laughs> yes, it is. I apologize. And then the chronic back pain, which never goes away. Yeah, I feel you there. And plus, worst of all, SGDQ is done. I saw that, and I've seen other people complaining. I watched, I watched a lot more of it than I ever have before. Um, I, I tried to watch as much as I could, but I'm not, like, 20 anymore, and my body can't <laughs> stay up that long. <laughs> I, I kind of feel bad when you watch it, and they're, like, just utterly breaking the game in horrible ways. <laughs> Because you know that the developers are got to be embarrassed. <laughs> and they're like, you know, hey, my game was on, you know, game's done quick. And they broke it for a <laughs> they, They're just putting, it's like airing all your dirty laundry out in the front yard. So I feel a little bad when I watch the, the ones where they glitch it. But Did you see any good runs? Anything that you remember? The guy that did the... Uh, oh, the guy that did the runs, um, Brothers, The Tale of Two Sons, mm. that was pretty impressive. I did I'm not, not get to like, see that one yet. I want to, yeah. I have a, a thread open of like all the VODs and I just want to go back and watch a bunch of these. I, I thought the, uh, Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past was probably the funniest one I saw the whole time. The couch, the guys on the couch were just <laughs> laughing my ass off the whole time. Uh, I was told that the Final Fantasy VII run was amazing. And given the fact well, that it's I nearly imagine. eight hours long, like they said it, it was entertaining the entire way through. I hope they like took breaks to stretch their legs and stuff. <laughs> you, don't want so. getting, you don't want anybody getting a blood clot over <laughs> speed running a game. <laughs> I'm sure they're fine. No one died That's yet. That's the mom in me coming out. Don't get a blood clot. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, kids. You have to stand up and get some exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Vitamin D deficiency because he did an eight-hour speed run. There, there was a clip floating around of when uh, Sephiroth kills Eris. Oh, spoiler. Sorry if you haven't played that 20-year-old <laughs> game yet. Uh, as soon as the sword goes through, you just hear someone off camera yell, Why? <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry. I mi- I'm sorry I missed it, and then I don't know where I'd ever find the eight hours to catch it either. <laughs> there, I might have to find the time to watch. It was just... <laughs> and then there was a new game called Splasher, I think was the name of it. Uh, I never heard of it before. The GDQ is the first time I ever saw it. It's like a mix between like De Blob, where you have to spray things with ink, and Super Meat Boy, in that it's ridiculously tough 2D platforming. And it was just, it was such a trip to watch. It was like a 5 a.m. stream where it was just the guy, his couch, the guys who were going to join him, who's like, yeah, they probably up too late it's okay i'll do this myself <laughs> i i think he was french and he, you know he, he clearly he could speak english but he was more focused on trying to get through the game yeah it was just 
he was so cool, so collected, and it was such an awesome game. You got to admit, when you watch those speedrunners and they're just like completely unfazed by everything that's happening in the game, and if we were to play that shit, we'd be sitting there like breaking controllers and Fuck cause this game. We, we would, Fuck this we'd have game. it on super mega easy crybaby mode. We'd still just put the controller down and walk away and be like, forget it. Fuck. No. Not today. I'm too, I'm too <laughs> old for anything above, like, normal. Yeah. No, I don't even put shit on normal if I don't have to for an achievement. <laughs> like, give me the easiest mode humanly possible because I'm old and cranky at this point. I just want to get through it. Same. I enjoy it, but I want to get through it. <laughs> Same here. Oh, man, we're getting old. <laughs> I Spe- think we're past the point of getting. We just are. <laughs> Speaking of being old, uh, there's a whole bunch of games that you and I get to talk to talk about today that are straight from the days of our youth. Indeed. Indeed. We're going to kick I, I things I think off. I remember some of them from my childhood, actually. I, I remember a bunch of them uh, mm-hmm. in, in certain ways as opposed to others. But the first game that we're going to talk about... It's called Micro Machines World Series, developed and published by Codemasters. It released June 30th on Xbox One, PS4, and Steam for $29.99. The legend is back. Micro Machines World Series combines the thrilling madness of racing micro vehicles with epic team battle strategies set against the extraordinary interactive backdrops of the everyday home. Grab your Nerf Blaster, try to avoid the jam, and take on the world. Uh, you, you put some time into this, correct? I did a little bit. Not, not an overwhelmingly exciting amount. I need to play it some more and I'm going to play it some more, but I I played it. Yeah. I think I've, I've been putting a big chunk of time into this. I've played online quite a bit. I was playing with, uh, Memories of Final. Uh, I'm sure some of our listeners know who he is. Uh, we were playing together for quite a bit. I was shocked about two things. One, how fun this is online. And two, how non-existent the single player is. Yeah. You can play against bots, but that's about it. I mean, they, <laughs> they do have limited local options. Like, I I thought there was going to be some kind of, like, Grand Prix or campaign or, like... Yeah something single player to it the the whole time that i've been seeing the trailers and everything else i don't know if i was missing like all the signs that hey this is a heavily heavily online focused game Mm -hmm. but i was i was kind of shocked when i started up the game it i did the tutorial and that's like quick match and i went to it it's like looking for games i'm like no i just want like a local quick match like (laughs) I don't want to get wrecked online just yet. <laughs> Calm down. But like, yeah, where's, it just where's goes the story? In. Where's the Grand Prix? And I was I was kind of surprised. I wasn't expecting that. I I gotta say though, we get so few online games through you know indie developers and stuff, and and the smaller the smaller groups that it's. At least, even without a single player, at least it did push the boundaries and have multiplayer. Because and there were it, it there was the far-fetched. possibility of a lot of people too. Yeah, that's true. And I've when I was playing, unfortunately, I just kept getting bots. Yeah, I, never, I, I ran into the same issue. Even even with final, and it seemed like if we would do a something like in a what are they the battle modes where the battle team versus team it would be me him maybe one other person and then a bunch of bots against like two or three humans and a bunch of bots and i don't know if the the player count is just that low right now or i you know i'm worried that i'm I'm kind of worried this is going to turn into deformers exactly because when I played, it was only bots. I never saw another another human player, and I was like, "Well, all right then." You know, it's it's hard to be like, "Oh my god, you should play this game. It's fun." There's nobody else to play against. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, just I'm legitimately bot. worried that the that there's I again I don't know if. 
there's just a really small player base for this right now. It is a fairly new release. I know some of the times I was playing it was pre-release with Memories of Final. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm sure that that was part of it. I'm just... It it was the The same issue with Deformers where it was all online and no one was there. The the other issue you've got to, to worry about too... Like you said, you guys were playing it pre-release and a little after release. That's that phase two where you're going to be running into other reviewers. And then you got to worry about, okay, when the reviewers move on to next week's games, <laughs> that's a pretty big exodus of the no. player base. <laughs> you know, now what? <laughs> no. Is it? Is it going to justify, is that player race going to be there to justify saying, oh, this game's so fun? I will say, if they were other reviewers, I was whipping their asses online. <laughs> like, See, I was doing really bad. It was a good thing I was playing against bots because then, like, nobody was streaming it or anything. <laughs> this is show how bad I was playing because I was genuinely struggling. <laughs> I don't do top down racing well at all. And I'm like, wee, I'm driving backwards. <laughs> and I'll. The elimination, like, it was like, go, and I was like, phew, right off the thing. And I was like, okay, well, fuck. <laughs> I had to sit and wait for the box to go through overtime and elimination when I was by myself. I, mm-hmm. I have noticed that the bots in the game are pretty brutal in some of the they modes. They are. They will, like, they will was, hunt you down. <laughs> I was shocked at how difficult it was. Like, the first time I played... Because I did some offline bot races before jumping online just to get the hang of the controls. My first race, I was in third. Yeah, out of four. I, took an ace. <laughs> I was third out of four. Like, what the <laughs> hell? It took me a few races before I got a win. I was proud of the one online race because even on the final lap, I wrecked like twice on the final lap because like a helicopter dropped a bomb on me or I just I flew off the course. <laughs> And I still won by like five seconds. <laughs> so I, I, again, I don't know who I was playing in that one, but I wrecked them all. Uh, you mentioned top down racing. We should probably talk about the actual game itself and not just the population. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if you were a fan of the old school micro machines games or like RC pro am very similar in style where it's the top down racing view, uh, you have basically tank controls where left goes left and right goes right, no matter where you're positioned. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you got to remember that you're pretty much controlling like an RC car and it's not, you know, direction is based on the controller, not where your vehicle is on screen. Yeah. So I know some people have trouble with that one but i i don't know i never really had problem with that i think the the course designs are awesome they're beautifully created uh, a lot of they're attention really to detail creative. yeah like like you're playing on it and you're just like oh my gosh they thought of that you know it's really it, it's just neat I, I know we had super toy cars on the xbox one quite a while ago this feels like super toy cars uh with the overhead style and just a shitload more detail. Like there's a lot of love and care that went into the design mm-hmm. of these levels from, you know, a kitchen table where you could run over jam and it leaves trails on the tablecloth. Still you push the Cheerios around when you go <laughs> past them. My mom, I recognize this scenery. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really well done, really well created game. Uh, as, as, in terms of the online modes, there are a lot of modes there. They have standard racing. They have uh, elimination style racing where the, the last person there wins. And if you fall off the screen, you lose. Uh, they have a handful of different battle modes, whether it's like just free for all, blow each other up, capture the flags, uh, king of the hill style mode. Like there's a ton of modes online. So if you're getting this and you're planning on playing online, there's there's tons there to do as long as you mm-hmm. can find people to do it with. If you're looking for something for like, you know, kill time at home by yourself, this this is a tough one to sell on. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to I do want to back up though to where you were talking about the attention to detail. 
one other thing that I was really happy to see, and and it's going to seem silly to a lot of people, I'm sure, but as you progress, you unlock the titles and stuff. You get the little loot crates, and, and they pop open, and there's titles. Generally, when there's a game like this, especially something pertaining to cars, and it's going to have those titles, and they're going to be male-centric. Uh, you know, Papa Bear or Big Daddy or something like that. When I played and I unlocked my first um, crate, it popped up with one of the titles. And I was surprised because it was gender-specific and it was for a female. Ooh, interesting. It actually popped up as a desktop diva. <laughs> yeah, I thought, that's that's a fluke. That's like it just one out of a hundred is aimed at females. And the next time played another race, popped another one, and it popped up Mama Bear. And I was like, these are all gender specific, and they are tailored to what you have your gender set as. Oh, that's pretty cool. It was very neat. And I was quite happy to see that because that's extremely rare. But it's a nice little attention to Indeed. Uh, for the people who might be freaking out at the at the words loot boxes in this game, there are no in-game microtransactions. All the loot and all the crates and everything, you earn them as you level up in the game. And mm -hmm. there is no way to buy them with real money. So don't worry it is all <laughs> done in game. I know a lot of people. They hear loot get crate and, and freak out. Freak and out. My penny. They become addicts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, personally, for thirty bucks, I think I I wish this had some kind of campaign. It's it's mm -hmm. as much fun as I am having with this game. I cannot give it a buy it just because of the lack of any kind of meaningful solo experience and the lack of any kind of player base right now. I really hope the game grows because similar to Deformers, what's there is really, really fun. I'd there's like just to see no it have one a there. free weekend or something to try to... Yeah, there's, there's just like, no like one deformers. there to have fun with yet. You know, you'll find a couple of people littered here and there, but hopefully uh, hopefully our giveaway that we're doing might help out <laughs> get someone new on there. So, yeah. What do you, what do you think for 30 bucks? I, I give it a solid try, and I hope people do try it. Um, I don't know if there's a free trial of it. I don't, I don't think know. there is. Um, if not, there should be, at least eventually. And a free weekend would probably do wonders for it because it is a lot of fun. Top down is not my favorite thing in the world. Top down racing, and I still, at, at least I could manage eventually. So, and I, I enjoyed it, even going against bots by myself. Good times. Well, anyway, we do have more games to talk about. More games of our youth, not just micro machines, but next game <laughs> to talk about. It's called ACA Neo Geo Metal Slug 2. Yes, we have finally heard back from Hamster, and we're going to give you a couple more Neo Geo games to talk about. Uh, Metal Slug 2 console version developed and published by Hamster Corporation. It released June 1st on Xbox One and PS4 for $7.99. It just released July 6th on the Nintendo Switch. Metal Slug 2 is an action game released by SNK in 1998. Players can choose from Marco, Tarma, Eri, and... E God these names Theo <laughs> like my my vision is like so blurry from watching GDQ all week the way it is <laughs> with uh Every with the aim of defeating the rebel me. army is plotting a coup once again in addition to heavy machine guns and shotguns from the previous games new weapons such as laser guns have been added for even more battle variations Cole what did you think of Metal Slug 2 I had a surprising amount of fun with this game. I swear I remember the Metal Slug series from being a kid. I don't know if I'm legitimately, legitimately remembering it. or See, if, I'm not like, the I'm only one who can't talk today. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It, it's every day with me. But, like, I, I don't know if I'm actually, like, remembering it or if it's just, like, triggering memories of playing games like it. Either way... 
the trip down memory lane is is enjoyable. It plays incredibly smoothly despite being, you know, ported to the Xbox One and being a almost Oh God! Is it almost thirty years old? <laughs> it's almost thirty. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> no, it's almost twenty. Eighty-eight. Ninety-eight. Or nine, Ninety-eight. Okay, yeah, twenty years old. Okay. Whew. <sighs> I swore okay. I thought you said Deep eighty-eight. Nope. Ninety-eight. <laughs> that doesn't make it any better. <laughs> it's not any better. I graduated high school. <laughs> uh, it's. It, it plays incredibly well. It plays incredibly smooth. Um, the the shooting action, you know, you use your left stick for movement and also for, for aiming. Uh, I wish you used the trigger to shoot, as usual. You press A to shoot. Uh, you get well, used to it. you can change those. They do have the options to change the controls. So that's your own fault. I, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I don't ever think to hit the controls. I have this odd quirk about when I'm doing something for review. I just want to play it out of the box, <laughs> and then then I get mad. I'm like, why didn't it? Wasn't it this way? And it was like, because you didn't change it, jackass. So because <laughs> you didn't explore the options screen. Yeah, <laughs> I go in, I hit subtitles, and then I'm usually out of the options. That's my <laughs> my own damn. <laughs> my own fault. I didn't I didn't find to change it to the trigger, but again, pressing A is not the worst thing in the world. Um there's it's it's your typical 2D, you know, move through the world and shoot things. It's almost like oh, what was that? Rise and shine? Mm-hmm. It's it's like Rise and Shine, but eight bit. <laughs> <laughs> in that, you know, you're just like not even eight bit, sixteen? Sixteen or something like that. I think they were. It's 16. pixelated. It's pixelated. It's rise and shine pixelated. And it was really neat that you could, you know, you had four different characters to choose from, one of whom was female. Uh, <laughs> and you could, you just walk through the, the area, absolutely plowing down enemies. The first set of enemies definitely showed its age. And it's probably politically insensitive <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> you know, she, she just talk it up to being from the past and move on. Because eventually you start plowing down mummies. And <laughs> the there's several different weapons. You, you start with your pistol. Um, as you progress, some of the enemies will drop. Some of them will be a heavy weapon. Sometimes it's grenades, sometimes it's rockets, sometimes it's the laser gun you mentioned. So it's just different ways to to just plow your way through these these onslaught of enemies. I was actually kind of surprised at how easy it was to progress through the game. Like in my head, all these old school games we played as kids were hard as fuck. <laughs> this one, I, I got quite far into it. On accident. <laughs> I was just like walking and shooting. And then all of a sudden I'm on level four or five. And I don't know how I did it. I, I will <laughs> say the Metal Slug games have aged incredibly well. They have like, like I said, I compared it to Rise and Shine. Because it really felt like something that would have just come out last week that we would have reviewed. Or, or you know, would be looking forward to next week. Because, hey, it's just you walk and you shoot. And it, it it didn't feel like it was a twenty year old game apart from the the questionable enemies in the beginning. <laughs> but <laughs> it it just felt like something you'd play any other time, I mean, even though it was it's an older game. Um it features four different modes. There's a high score mode, which is basically just mow down as many enemies as you can. In, yeah, in it's, it's basically the, time. the same four modes that are in every AC. Every game. one of them. Yeah. And then the, the caravan mode and then the Japanese mode. Yeah. I didn't play the Japanese edition. Um, I, I figured if there was any kind of text, I probably wouldn't be able to read it. So I just I just let it go. 
<laughs> yeah, you see the, Japanese like, that's for people who are better at games than me. Oh, yeah, well. If you're new to the ACA games, that's going to be how all of them are. Everyone is going to have the, the Japanese version, the American mm-hmm. version, a caravan mode and a high score mode. See these these were my first two ACA yeah. games. I haven't I haven't played any of the others, so I didn't really know what I was getting into other than hey, these are retro games. You're missing out so on I some was, good stuff. I clearly am because like I said, I I didn't expect to have this much fun, but I was I was really enjoying it. My only major complaint is at one point, like I said, I made it four or five levels into Metal Slug Two and I hit the back button and the only there was no resume option my option was quit to the title screen quit to the menu and you know close out the game completely were were Which, you in high score mode i don't think so no i was in i was in the regular the regular mode but if, like if you were in regular mode you i know if you just... press start and there's like a, a save and all that but I pressed something else and I got a different menu and it would not let me out of it until I just backed out completely and lost all my score and progress and everything. And I was like, well, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know uh, high score and caravan mode, they will not let you pause it. Mm-hmm. So if you pause it, the only option is to like restart the game. Uh, if you were playing standard at the bottom, there should have just been return to game. Yeah, I couldn't find a return to game. That one didn't work. I don't know. You broke I don't know something. what I did. I broke something. I hit a button somewhere that was not what it was supposed to have done. <laughs> Which is that's not a norm, you know, unusual for me. It's it's perfectly within the realm of my normal. <laughs> I break things. But you know, otherwise a- apart from fucking up and losing my own game somehow, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And I I give it a solid buy it. Nice. Uh I, I absolutely agree. The Metal Slug games are always going to be good. Next ACA game to talk about is called ACA Neo Geo Shock Troopers. Console version, again, developed and published by Hamster Corporation. This one released March 9th on Nintendo Switch for $7.99. And the sequel, which is actually the, the game that I requested, uh, because that one released June 8th, I, I don't know what happened with my contact at Hamster, but it seems like he's a month behind on my requests. <laughs> so that's that's why we're reviewing games from a month ago, and this is supposed to be something from June 8th, but he, he accidentally sent us a code for the original Shock Troopers that released March 9th. Uh, so we're covering the first one. Shock Troopers is an action game released by SNK in 1997. Eight mercenaries challenge the monstrous terrorist organization. Thrilling action shooting. Players take part in a rescue operation for Dr. George and his granddaughter who have been kidnapped by the evil organization Bloody Scorpion. The game features the ability for players to choose which route to progress, adding even more replayability to the title. Uh, This plays a lot like old school top down action adventure games uh if if you've played like akari warriors on the nes or in the arcade i i don't think i know if i did it was so long ago (laughs) (laughs) well think think of metal slug but instead you have a top-down perspective pretty much uh the interesting mechanic here is in a lot of these shooters you could basically only shoot like up yeah. Your, your character will be at the bottom and you'll walk left and right and you'll just be shooting forward the whole time. Uh, this changes it up because you still have 360 degrees of movement and you're going to have to navigate the entire screen because, you know, you'll start off scrolling up and then you'll hit a wall and you'll start scrolling to the right and enemies will be coming from the right. They'll be coming from behind you. So it's not just shoot the enemies in front of you. It shoot all the enemies everywhere. Uh, the The controls can be kind of confusing at first because whatever direction you're facing in is where you're going to shoot. If you hold the shoot button down, you just start strafing instead of turning. So if mm. you if you uh, 
are trying to, to spray and pray and hit enemies in all kinds of directions, you're not going to be able to hold down the shoot button. You're pretty much going to want to just mash it while turning back and forth. Uh, I have had situations against boss battles where I have a nice aim set up. I'm strafing, holding the button down, chucking grenades when I can. Uh, and then I have to m turn and move a different direction. So I let go of the fire and then I start shooting again, but I'm shooting like the complete wrong direction now. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's how I would shoot. It'd be like back over my shoulder while I'm looking in another yeah. direction. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, a really, shot. it's a really unique control scheme in it. But given that, again, this was an old arcade game. They didn't have twin stick, you know, <laughs> Xbox controllers in the arcades in 97. You just, you had your joystick and your th four action buttons to mess with uh so adapting it to controller is is awkward to to play at first but once you get used to it it f plays really well uh the game runs great on the switch uh no kind of hiccups or slowdowns or anything that you know wouldn't have already been in the old arcade version because again as a 20 year old game uh I had a lot of fun with it. I've I've never played the Shock Troopers games before. One of the Neo Geo series that kind of I don't know was just never in my area. None of my none of my arcades had that before, so it was pretty yeah. cool to get my hands on it and and try out a series that I never got to play before. Uh, I actually went and bought the second game afterwards because I wanted to play the other one as well. Uh, nice. Didn't get to dive into that one yet, but I plan on jumping into it soon uh for the eight bucks if you've got a switch it's awesome old school retro gameplay i hope the shock troopers games jump to other platforms eventually because it's really cool good stuff nice and then the final neo tough, geo though. game what'd you say i said it sounds tough though it is it is but hey a lot of these Neo Geo games can be stupidly tough because they were arcade games. They, they're they supposed to be tough. They're supposed to eat all your quarters. So <laughs> That's a good point, too. I didn't think of it like that. You're right. That's why in the standard versions of the games, you can go in and fuck with the dip switches and, like, drop the difficulty all the way down, give yourself extra lives. Yeah, I found that. <laughs> so you found that, but you didn't find where you could change the controls. I was up in the lives, man. Oh, <laughs> the lives man. continues to stop. <laughs> anyway, the last of the Neo Geo games to talk about is called King of the Monsters, console version developed and published by Hamster Corporation. Released June 8th on Xbox One for $7.99, King of the Monsters is an action game released by SNK in 1990. One. <laughs> oh man. My back hurts just saying that. <laughs> Players choose from one of six monsters available and battle their way across Japan in order to claim the title of the strongest monster. In addition to normal attacks such as punches and kicks, master more destructive techniques such as flame and beam attacks to overcome the enemies. Cole, what did you think of King of the Monsters? King of the Monsters again has aged really well um you can choose between six different um monsters to play as you can also choose to play against the computer as a bot or against an actual second player which i was surprised by you wouldn't expect the game <laughs> to have local multiplayer that's that old uh, but it did. You could you could load up another controller and just lay into your best friend, whoever's sitting on the couch beside of you. Uh, again, you, six well, of course monsters. It has that. Have... They were old arcade games. They had two I players. know, but man, that old. I don't know. You think I was, of like I was more Mortal impressed Kombat by the fact that the game Kombat. has a co-op against the computer. It did. It did have. I didn't try the co-op against the computer. I did lay into my oldest daughter in in <laughs> in a versus match together, but we did not do the co-op. But uh, you can each each of the different characters that you can play as. They're all pretty similar 
fight wise like oh, oh you can punch you can kick and you can jump <laughs> and not much else but they all have their own little special move they equal out though they all do the same damage with their special move but they all have a different little animation that they might do um you have several different scenes where you can just absolutely destroy cityscapes while you're smashing and flinging each other around. It's like the old Godzilla versus Mothra, wasn't that it? <laughs> like where you, they're just throwing each other into buildings, you know, Godzilla versus King Kong, stuff like that. That's yeah. how it plays. And it's just got a little pixelated style to it. It's really, really neat. The only other, the only thing that like I would really complain about it is just that there's so few limited moves. It's an, it's a game from 1991 though, but there's there's not a lot of variation. It's like okay, punch, punch, kick, punch, punch, kick, punch, punch, kick. Okay, now what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. Oh, it wait, is a very I limited can game. And throw you. So it. You can kind of wear it out quickly, and then, but for and little then you have to pin them because it's a wrestling game too. It is, and that was the thing. Like I caught it, I, I didn't get it at first, but when the the Godzilla like monster went running off the screen and running back, and then like clotheslined them, and I was like, "That's from wrestling." <laughs> that was so weird. There's, there's even, I, I guess pseudo ropes if you will like <laughs> electric lines that you can throw each other into and get electrocuted and it was just so quirky but fun but it, it is more limited so in that regard it's it's more of a try it than an oh you have to buy this it's more yeah, it's fun it's good for nostalgia yeah, but th you're only is... gonna play it little quick spurts maybe one or two matches against a friend before you're like okay next yeah this is <laughs> definitely a nostalgia game for me i used to play this game constantly in the arcades i fucking loved this game in the <laughs> arcades i even owned it uh the super nintendo port i used to play with my brother all the time so when I saw this one release on Xbox, I was like, "Fuck yeah!" And the reason yeah. you're, the reason you're reviewing it is because I bought it when it came out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was I was at the point where I wasn't sure if we'd be hearing from Hamster or not because things went kind of silent for a bit. And as you can see, we're reviewing things from a month ago. But uh, I I was so thrilled that the game came out. I bought it immediately, and wow, it is it is absolutely fun but it has aged significantly worse than metal slug i'll say that yeah uh, yeah it's a lot better than a bunch of the other fighting games that are out there in the aca collection just again because the difficulty in so many of those fighting games is just brutally unfair uh, at least in king of the monsters you can you know play it and enjoy it and beat some monsters and wreck a city and beat shit up that's funny when it pops up and shows you how many casualties they were because of you guys <laughs> stomping around and destroying like way to guilt trip me for just having fun i can only kill twenty thousand people shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah i it, i loved king of the joking. monsters i was so and it was excited fun. it's it's not you know brutal in any kind of way well i mean they get electrocuted but it, it was you know, I, I didn't feel bad about throwing the controllers at the kids and saying, here, fight with each other for a few minutes. <laughs> How do you feel about it? And they're like, that's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's for the price. It, like I said, it's more nostalgia than anything, but it was it was still kind of fun. I, I agree. Give it a, it, yeah. And if you're a fan of that, that kind of stuff like you were, then, you know, absolutely you're not going to want to miss it anyway. Yeah. I, they, I know there's a lot of fans of it aren't even going to give a fuck about what I say about it. They've already bought it <laughs> months yeah. ago. I know there's a lot of people who bitch about the Neo Geo games being eight bucks each. Then they're like, oh, I'm going to wait for a sale. I'm going to wait for a bundle. None of these games have been bundled on other platforms. So mm -hmm. stop waiting for it to happen because <laughs> I probably not going to happen. 
Uh, they've done the Arcade Archive series on PlayStation for, you know, since near the near the launch of the console. And while the Neo Geo games are finally coming to Xbox as well as PlayStation and Switch, uh, that those original Arcade Archives games, they never ever really went on any kind of significant sale they Mm. were never bundled at all so people expecting sales or bundles on these don't get your hopes up just well i think though like people see you know that they all have the same you know series name the aca and neo geo and they assume that they're all going to be alike in some way or another and that's why they expect them to be bundled these are better if you just pick the ones that are your type of gameplay. If you like shooters, pick up Metal Slug 2. If you like fighters, skip Metal Slug 2 and pick up pick up <laughs> King of the Monsters instead. Don't think that you've got to get every single... They're not Pokemon. You don't got to yeah. collect them all. It's definitely pick, the ones, pick the ones you're going to enjoy. Like. Cherry pick. So, and, and appreciate yeah. the fact that you could get a Neo Geo game for $8, where in our day, Neo Geo games <laughs> literally cost hundreds of dollars for a single game. Look it and up, then, kids. Then, that shit was expensive. Neo Geo games <laughs> were fucking expensive. And think of how much you would have spent if you were going to an arcade and plunking down. Shit. You know, your quarters to play. Like, how much did we pay for games back then when we were just throwing quarters at the machine? Seriously. It's nuts. You could you could lose a hundred bucks a month just playing one game of you know, like just trying to get through the tower at Mortal Kombat or something, but Or hell, even uh even the, the virtual console Neo Geo games on the Wii, those were mm-hmm. nine bucks each. So you're still getting them cheaper. Still a deal. <laughs> it's still, still a bargain. Getting them cheaper. <laughs> but yeah, that is. Uh, I guess that's it with you, Eternal. It, it is. Good, you're it's done. Good with having me. you on here. Thank you. Do you have any any final words to wrap it up before we move on? Mm, no. <laughs> I'm I'm never gonna get good at coming up with with a segue out of here. So. Thanks for having me. (laughs) It's okay. You tried. Next game to talk about is called Princess Maker 3 Fairy Tales Come True, developed and published by CFK Corporation or Company Limited. Released June 27th on Steam for $19.99. You must take care of a little girl and raise her as your own daughter. A fairy named Uzu appears as an advisor, and the new feature of selecting the player's occupation is added into the game system. Schedule... Schedule system allows players to select 15 days of scheduling from each class, unique rivals, and events make an appearance to add drama elements to the game. The interface has been made simpler than previous Princess Maker series, and the album mode allows you to view images from vacation or ending within the game. Kind of ingrishy, but uh, to make sense of it all, we have our good friend Pernell Vaughn. Pernell, how are you doing today? Doing all right, sir, though... I'm not 100% sure that I'll be able to make sense of the English because it was it got to me too, just a tad. But uh, not overall, it's a good weekend. I'm doing all right. How about you? Oh, long day. Long day. <laughs> that I can relate to so very well. But it's done. Fun Relaxation stuff. Session. Indeed. <laughs> and then I have a long morning tomorrow. So. Get mornings just be mellow and relax like they show on tv i wish so yeah princess maker 3 what is this game because i know you were excited about it i was because a little backstory um back in like say 1998 i got access to a fan translation of the dos version of princess maker 2 and a friend and I would play them like constantly, and we compare how our daughters were growing up. It was the weirdest thing, <laughs> but the game was a lot of fun. It's a very simple game, but in and of itself, that's probably what made it so fun. So, as you can probably imagine, Princess Maker never got a re- U.S. release here, or at least it didn't until the year 2016, when two got re-released over here as Princess Maker Two Refine, and then we got to the point we're at now where we got Princess Maker Three. 
They were originally done by Gynax, believe it or not. Um, you know, the guys who did Evangelion. Uh-huh. So, so of course, when you was like, hey, you want to introduce? Like, yeah, I was, you, I was this close to buying it. Or rather, I did, and I had to request a refund. That's how much I was excited to buy this, <laughs> this game. I had already bought it. Um, and I, I won't lie. The game is definitely still what I like about Princess Maker games in general. But it did have a few weird, like, crashes, and it had a moment where it was a period of time where I just couldn't get it to boot up. I had to constantly, I had to uninstall, reinstall, uninstall, reinstall. And, like, the third time's a charm, it actually worked for me. And I haven't had any issues with that since. But I did have two freezes. I'm not sure if that's something that they're working on or what. But casting all that aside, let's talk about the game itself. You, as, as Joe described, you are a person who is tasked with raising a daughter who was pretty much a reincarnation of a fairy. And she's somehow 10 years old. We don't understand any of that. In fact, the fairy, after you um, after you create your character profile, she erases your memory. It's like, here you go. You got a kid. <laughs> it's like it's never ever happened. Nothing's different. You just have to have a 10-year-old now. And um, you start out, you have to name your child, which took me 20 minutes because I'm terrible at naming children. Um, you choose your kid's birthday, the kid's blood type, and your own birthday. And I'm not, I mean, I, they, I know it affects the kid's astrological sign and yours, but I'm not sure if it has the effect on the story, though it very well may, since this game is heavily based around events. Um, then you choose your profession, which I wasn't quite sure about how that worked initially. I chose to be a merchant, and the Great Fairy made sure to let me know that my life was nothing more than coveting riches with no no concern for anything else in my life. So much money that I had nowhere else for which to store it. So, <laughs> apparently I was a covetous man. But hey, gotta get the work done to sell those goods, you know what I'm saying? So, whatever, yeah, fairy indeed, lady. you do um, you. That's right. So I did learn, I did have to look it up later, but I did figure out what the purpose of the profession is, aside from, you know, the great fairy, you know, being a jerk towards you. <laughs> Um, it affects how much money you start the game with. It affects the amount of money that you're paid every couple of months because Uzu will give you money. So basically, he's he's giving you like child support. Um, there's a failure credit, which is which I never experienced, thankfully. Where if you go bankrupt, the gum the great fairy will cut you a loan, and the amount that you're will they're able to be lent is based on your starting profession and also your parental disposition. If you're a happy parent or a strict parent or a disciplinarian of sorts, all based around what job you pick. Such a imagine if that's how real life was. Like, depending on the job you choose, you will always be a complete piece of shit. Like, I want to be a doctor. Oh, you're an awful human being, concerned with nothing but playing with people's lives, doctor. <laughs> it's like, what is, what, I, I donate money to orphans on a regular basis. Not, not good enough. Not good enough. You're a horrible human being. But once you get through all that stuff, the game will kick you in and you are officially raising this kid. And it becomes what's basically a scheduling simulator. Um, you start out the kid standing up looking at you. You get to choose between a number of different events you can have your child do. You can either give your child different lectures, set your child up for lectures in the form of, like, say, art class, normal class, cooking, martial arts music fasting which shocked the shit out of me i i thought they were talking about it's called diet class and i've played a lot of japanese role-playing games which make me think about the diet building so i was like maybe they mean diet as in you know learn how to be a successful businesswoman no (laughs) they mean sit on the floor with classmates and starve your ass to death but not quite to death just close enough to lose some weight um but yeah diet class and like a number of other professions. Then you can also opt to like give her a part-time job. You can be like a farmer or a babysitter. You can do housekeeping. A number of different jobs. And when I gave my daughter the choice of being a farmer, a little farmhand, she spent all of her time doping around and leaning on cows eating apples and crap. I was very insulted by my child doing that. But at the same time, she's also a 10-year-old, so what did I expect her to do? Should've and my her. kid was also... I wasn't beating my kid. She's no, no, digital. No. I don't care. She's more. She's more lively than my real kid, which is non-existent. So there you go. 
<laughs> She's the closest I got right now. And I ain't spanking my baby. She's um, all I have. <laughs> I named her Celestia, by the way. She's adorable. Um, so all those things I mentioned. Oh, and also you can take her on, send her on vacation or just let her play in town, which is very funny because you're not in town with her. The fairy Uzu's in town with her. So I don't picture Uzu stopping a kidnapper from taking my daughter and running off with her. She's going to run back and tell me what I'm going to freaking do. But, um, every time you do one of these different activities, it affects a ridiculous number of stats you have to track for her. I actually wrote them all down. But stamina, intelligence, vitality, pride, morality, elegance, attitude, sense, charm, courage, trust, height, weight, bust, waist, and hip. Good lord. I have never had to track so many stats in my life. I think the I think Princess Maker Two had less stats to track. But um so essentially as you play this game and you do these different activities. These stats will go up, they'll go down, and that'll affect any number of things. There's, a, there's another stat called stress, where if you overwork your kid or you don't give her enough breaks, her stress meter will go too high and she has a high chance of getting sick, which is not what you want. I didn't let my baby get sick, just saying. So I don't know what happens there because I'm a good parent. and I'm not going to make my kid sacrifice her health for my evil review experimentation just know don't let your kid get sick um <laughs> one thing i thought was funny though is like every once in a while depending on the different types of activities you do and when you do them sometimes an event will get triggered and depending on how you raise your kid and how their stats broke down it will determine how, how well they do one example that i ended up with while i played the game was a, a surprise exam came up it was four it was a four section exam that added up to 100 points like social studies and science and like two other things i don't remember she scored a 29 out of 100 i wanted to cry like clearly i didn't have my kids study hard enough and her response was i don't want my dad to find out i don't want him to be disappointed in me my trust stat went down too and I didn't get a chance to confront her and say, you know, Uzu ratted your ass out, right? I know you failed your goddamn exam. <laughs> what you going to say about that? But no, nah, no, I didn't have a chance to. All I could do the next day was say, hey, how you doing? And she was like, I'm cool, Dad. I don't trust you or nothing, but I, yeah, I'm good. Um, there were two other events I remember. Well, another event that I had came across was, and Princess Maker 2 had events like this as well, where depending on how high your stats are, there's like a regular event that can take place in the game, like a tournament or a contest, any number of things of that nature, where if your stats are high enough, you can win a prize. It's like there's a New Year's festival that happens every year where the Royals will weigh a series of comp um, competition, a number of other girls, and you're including your kid, and if your kid's the most elegant, you'll win $3,000. And who knows, maybe some accolades. I wouldn't know because my kid is rough around the edges who eats apples behind cow's butts. I don't know. <laughs> but point is... I'm going to go back to that game later, and she's going to win that elegance competition because I ain't raising no chump. <laughs> Royals have to walk over her. The hell with that. But believe it or not, that is the entirety of the game. Though some things worth pointing out, I thought that was kind of funny, is that when you set your schedule, there's about probably 192 periods in the year. They outright tell you. But from what I could tell, when you set at the kid's schedule, I don't think there's a limit to how far you can go. So if you want to write, set up the entire 192 in one shot, you probably can. Just like line up 192 events, click go, and hope that your kid doesn't die by the end of it. Um, you also, one thing that made me sad about the game is that it actually took away something that I liked heavily in 2, which was the expedition adventure mode. And what that was, was depending on you can send your kid off on adventures so there was like a number of different locations on the game and it became like a pseudo rpg where you walked around the map you found treasure you ran across npcs fought monsters all that and your skills were based on like how well you did like in martial arts class or you know how rough your kid was around the edges and then that also in turn led to a number of endings like you can marry your, you couldn't become a princess because your kid was too rough but your kid didn't need to be didn't need to be a prince because she she ran her own dojo stuff like that. Um, but they took that out of the game entirely. There's no adventure mode, which made me really sad because that was one of my favorite components to two. Um, but I will say it didn't make the game bad. It just meant it was lacking something that I missed. Yeah. The game itself is still a lot of fun. 
just know that when you go into this game, you're not getting action, you're not getting excitement, but you are getting a lot of fun. Well, who am I kidding? You are getting some excitement. You're watching a kid grow up. That's very <laughs> exciting. And when it's all said and done, your money is still in your pocket. So, hey, what's not to like, right? Yeah. If you screw up your job, load up another save file. Try 20, again. 20 bucks for this is significantly cheaper than the cost of raising an actual child. You damn right it is, and that's where I sign up for. People think I hate children. Oh no, I love children. I hate the money they cost. I hate that very much. So, <laughs> as crazy as it may sound, being able to play a simulator with a kid is pretty fun to me. It's nice to just kind of sit there and run the numbers. Like, well, my kid became a success. What about your kid? Man, eh, my kid's delinquent. Yeah, that's cool. Let's go get beers. Yeah, it's like, it's <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. Now, and I'm, I'm curious to know, I see on Steam that it is sitting at an overall mixed review, mixed reputation. Like, what, what's, uh, what is the community upset about with the game? I think it's because there's a, like I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the review, it's, it's glitchy. Like, I've had freezes when I played the game. And when I couldn't get the game to start up, I went looking around and it seemed like a number of people were having the issue where they just couldn't get the game low. Like, it would go on an infinite attempt at booting up until it eventually gave up. Though, they eventually say, yeah, we patched it, try it now. And I assume that the patch worked because I was able to boot it up. But who knows how many other people out there still can't get the game to boot up. Yeah. And I know I was getting crashes, so other people were probably getting crashes. Plus, there's a number of spelling and grammatical errors in the game, too. So it's not perfect. And even beyond that, could be people disappointed about lack of expedition mode because I can imagine a number of people, you know, you know, the general public where if you see there's really good or it's really bad. And if you're missing something that they liked in the first game, it becomes really bad immediately. So that could be a thing, lack in that mode. Um, aside from that, though, I'm not 100% sure. But I think those would probably be the main reasons. Oh, and of course, it's not an action based game. People probably want something more than it actually provides. Yeah. Like more than it was meant to be provided, and you got to remember, this game was originally made in the '90s. So this game was made in the '90s, translated and ported to Steam in 2017. We're talking at least 20 years, about 20 years of this game just stewing. So someone could buy this game expecting something that got released at minimum 2010. They're getting a game from the '90s, and they're like, "What the hell is this crap?" So, man, this episode is just jam packed with twenty year old games. <laughs> that's not. What were some of the other games? Uh, we we just uh, went over a handful of the ACA Neo Geo games before you joined us. There's, oh, there's more coming out. Jeez. Dude, they, like every week, there's new ones coming out. Well, if they're, if they're if you're able to write back to them, tell them to put Magical Drop Three on the Switch, not Two. I don't know what the heck they were thinking there. Eh, two's better oh. than nothing. True, but knowing that three actually exists is why I can't buy two. It's like, well, <laughs> when you give me the game that I want, I'll buy it. Like said, so like Catan on it was you on Xbox 360 back in the day, and when it came out, I was like, I love Catan. People are like, you gonna buy it? Like, nope, because Cities and Nights is the expansion that makes the game fun. And if you can't give me Cities and Nights, I don't want to play the game. <laughs> and of course, I never got Cities and Nights, so I never bought Catan. But uh, that's how I roll. If I know better exists, I'm waiting for the better. Don't 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 make me buy your game twice with some loyalty pack. If you know if you show us your support, like no, you know what it takes to get my support. Don't front. So, but um, but yeah, this game I think is honestly fun. You just know as long as you go into it knowing what you're going to get, and heaven forbid they fix, make sure that these darn crashes stop happening. If there's a way to do it, because it could even be something as a matter of. You know, it's set, it was meant to work on old hardware. They never, they never got around to like actually completely going through it and making sure that it was one hundred percent compatible with present day hardware. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, let so, me uh, let me see if I could read your review properly uh, based on the overall glitchiness of the game and the fact that it's a niche title. Despite how fun it is, overall it gets probably a try it rating. Yes. You're see you're you're starting to understand how I roll, man. We got this thing going here. I like it. Um, but yes, I definitely would say it's a try it kind of game because there's definitely some hiccups as far as performance goes and grammatical issues and the like. And it may not be what everybody's searching for, but if you like semi types, like simulator type stuff, you have a nurturing side to you. 
you're cheap as shit and don't want to pay for a real child. <laughs> all those things are good qualifiers to give this game a shot. But it isn't a one screw it wasn't it isn't a one size fit all sort of title, so Yeah. All right, sounds good. Purnell, thanks as always for coming on and uh covering the game for us, and I'm sure we'll hear from you again soon. Thank you, good sir. It was my pleasure. Right. I got a daughter to go back to. You. Next game to talk about is called Chrono Link DX, developed by Give Me Five Entertainment, released July 6th on iOS and Android for $9.99. In Chrono Link DX, you are t- you're tasked with uh, connecting cube shaped like animals in as few moves as possible to progressively unlock historical eras. There are a total of eight eras in the game, each leading to a more ev- to ever more challenging puzzles. Meet new characters, learn new mechanics, and hum along to the mesmerizing soundtrack as you experience history from a whole new perspective. After all, to travel forward in time, you must first understand the past. We had our friend Jacob Garner cover this one, and he emailed in his review, and uh, he says... Chrono Link DX is a puzzle game from Give Me Five, which I just covered. In it, you'll explore different time periods, moving to the next level by making sure all of the puzzle pieces connect in 15 or less moves. Each time period introduces new puzzle pieces while still using pieces from previous eras. It's simplistic in description, but the game gets fairly complex uh, quickly after about 10 levels of hand-holding. The game is perfect for commutes or quick play in the bathroom, and while it doesn't save your position within the puzzle itself when quitting, it doesn't matter due to there only being 15 moves in a puzzle. There's definite longevity in the game as there's 200 puzzles in it, and if you get frustrated, you can come back at a later time and it's easy to pick right back up. If you like previous games that I've reviewed like Bluck or Blocko or Zirkle, then I definitely recommend you check out Chrono Link DX. So thank you for that, Jacob. That was a quickie. But, uh, you know, lots going on this episode, so let's move on. And finally tonight, we have two more games to talk about. And uh, joining us to, to wrap things up is our good friend Chris Taylor. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I find that I'm frequently the last person now. <laughs> You're that's, you're that's you're a good one to wrap things up. Ah, that and like not... I recorded all the other stuff already, so you're the last I'm the, one I'm recording. Yeah, I'm the last one to get ready <laughs> to be like, hang on, I gotta play this game for five more minutes. You're the last one with your shit together. Yes, exactly. That and you were you were at Whataburger, and I swear one of these days I'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to try Whataburger. Oh man, we'll come to Texas. It will be my treat, not the trip, just the just the water burger. Oh well, if you were paying for the trip, I would have been there. Ow! Oh. I, I actually looked it up, and apparently they have them in Fayetteville, Arkansas now. So if I ever do one of my summer trips to Arkansas again, yeah, it's there. Go, go get um, go get some water burger with the one ups or uh, or Lucio. I know Lucio likes water burger. He posts about it sometimes. I'll have to have him uh, bring me some at Magfest. Be like, just, you know, wrap it up. <laughs> It'll get, yeah, I was going to say, the cold water burger is not the same quality. You could nuke it, right? <laughs> just toss it in the microwave for a few uh, minutes. Sure, sure. <laughs> anyway, are we, are we talking about video games this week? Nah, <laughs> might as well. Uh, you, you cover two games for us this week, and we're going to start things off with a game called Toby the Secret Mind, developed by Lucas Navratil. Published by our friends at Head Up Games, it released July 6th on the PS4 for fourteen ninety nine. Previously available on Xbox and Steam, a peaceful way of life in a small village in the mountains was thrown into disorder. Someone has kidnapped most of its residents. A couple of brave hearts tried to rescue their friends, but none of them has returned. Little Toby didn't want to just sit and wait, so he decided to find them by himself. He went to the near deep... Mm-hmm. He uh, bleh. he went to the near deep forest, but he soon realized that this is just the beginning. Go with Toby on an eerie adventure in a dark and creepy world full of dangerous situations, enemies, and challenging puzzles. Chris, what'd you think of this one? All right, Toby, the secret mine. Well, I it definitely struck me with a sense of familiarity. <laughs> uh, it basically looks exactly like Limbo. Which is that um, that that one game that came out the years ago? Um, I don't know how many years ago, so it's just the years. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
like when the years fly by, you don't know how many years. It's just they have there are years and they have flown. Yeah. Um, so at first glance, it's it's kind of like that, and indeed, it is a challenge platformer. Um, I guess you know, in my my limited experience in video games, um, I like to to um, specify like in platformers that like there's an action platformer and there's a there are like puzzle platformers and then like challenge platformers. I guess it's like it's between challenge and and puzzle. Um, you know, action being where you actually interact with like enemies or something. You don't do that in this game. There's no, um, <laughs> no run and gunning. <clears throat> so, uh, it's interesting, like what you just, uh, summarized right there is, is, um, the first time I had ever heard or known what the story is in Toby, the secret mine or Toby, the secret mine. Sorry. Because, it's one of those games, it just starts up and you're going. Mm. <laughs> There's a little bit of a title screen where you can then say continue or just go. And uh, and yeah, as soon as you go, it's just like you're there, like you're starting the game. So there's practically no story to it, but you get the sense because of how simple everything is laid out, like of what's going on. Um, you are a little black thing looks kind of like a cat, kind of like a person, maybe a person with cat ears, um, something like that. And <laughs> the um, due to, I suppose, the bloom lighting that has been applied to everything, um, it's kind of like, you know how things are dark when the sun is behind them because, you know, they're, they become a silhouette sort of thing? Yeah. That's sort of how... That's sort of how this game is. It has like all this lighting, but everything that you're looking at, like in the uh, in the playing field, is pitch black. So the challenge is not only um, figuring out how to proceed um, in the mine by you know pushing things around or flipping switches or finding secret areas, things like that. Like not only do you have to navigate all that, you have to do it in. Uh, in a silhouette so you don't know if you can push something you don't know whether it is uh you know uh what kind of thing it is or what happens if you go up to it so you know and plus everything blends into the background so you're kind of like running around and then uh you know you're like okay i can't jump up here and oh okay here part of the wall is actually a crate and i'm going to uh to push this crate which, by the way, this game absolutely fails the uh, the start to crate ratio <laughs> <laughs> set up by Old Man Murray back in uh, in the years ago. Internet, okay. um, because it, a crate is one of the first things you actually interact with in the whole game. So, <laughs> hate to say it, but um, so about Toby and the Secret Mine, it is basically like that. It's it's you're going through solving the puzzles. Um, chasing down these much larger kids with cat hats on or evil cats or whatever with red eyes as they kidnap like they kidnapped all your friends and they're like dragging them off in cages and such and so you're you're basically chasing after them but if you go too fast then you might actually miss saving your friends because they're usually hidden around the stages so um the one counter that the game has is how many friends you've saved and uh the total being 26 and I, I think I saved like five or six by the time I got a few, uh, I got about a dozen, maybe 20 screens in or so. And I feel like I probably missed a few, but I was trying to get through it. Uh, <clears throat> so it's got that. Um, what I really liked about the game is that the background that isn't obscured in darkness is really gorgeous. It's got great light effects. Um, the background looks really nice. Um, the sound effects are really crisp. There's not really a soundtrack to speak of, but um, you know, it's it's a, a pleasant game aesthetically, even if it's a little disturbing because it's all dark and such. <clears throat> but I felt like it 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 made me uh, feel better to look at it than than Limbo did, because <laughs> mm. I felt like Limbo was just there to make you uncomfortable, you know. Plus, this <clears throat> game has colors. 
yes, it has some colors. <laughs> like, it has a fully colored background and stuff. It's, like I said, it's one of those things, it's not like that everything's just black and white, it's that you can't see the actual field in which you are playing. So, um, yeah, I had some fun with this one. It was, uh, it was one of those where I just played it until the puzzles got too hard, and then I kind of was like, okay, I'm moving on now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I think that this type of game definitely has its audience, and if you're the kind of person who likes um, puzzle challenge platformers that are, like, pleasant to look at, but also edgy and a little bit creepy, then I think this is a really good pick. And it's very impressive that it was more or less done with one guy. Yeah. Like, did, wasn't it... Didn't he do most of the programming and the art and everything? I <laughs> believe so. And then I know uh, Head Up Games stepped in to help with, like, porting and stuff like that. Because it was originally a Steam game. Uh, showed up on Xbox One a couple of months ago. Something yeah. like that. I'm trying to, trying to remember what the release date was on that. Uh, January. That's what it was. Showed up there uh-huh. in January, and now it uh, now it hit PlayStation. I'm confused at the fact that on Steam and on Xbox, the game is nine ninety nine, but <laughs> for some reason, the PlayStation Four version is fourteen ninety nine. That um, I don't really get that myself. I mean, last time I pointed that out, the developer got a little mad at me, I guess. So I don't really have an opinion there. <laughs> I I guess I can just say that like um you know they may have added some things but there's nothing in the game or in the game's like descriptions or anything to indicate that so I'm trying sure to remember know. what developer got mad at you Oh it was um it was Mastiff for Guruman Ah which is funny because there's so many 1499 games that I want to play now. It's just that was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but like 1499 seems to be the the indie game price tag. I think we may be experiencing a um, maybe a mass inflation. Yeah, <clears throat> I I think 15 is like the standard price for the majority of games that come out anymore i remember the day back in the early <laughs> days of the xbox 360 you could get video what? games for 4.99 oh my goodness 4.99 you don't say yeah 4.99 was the the normal and then it went to 9.99 and now it's like 14.99 a lot of them are getting closer to 19.99 yeah so i feel like um i don't know I feel like seven ninety nine has been a thing forever, but that's only because I play mo- largely Nintendo, and most of their virtual console um, premium stuff is is seven ninety nine. Yeah, Super Here. Nintendo games are seven ninety nine. <laughs> yes, except Earthbound. Even. Yeah, it has the Earthbound tax on it, but you know what? I forgive them because collectors made God, that game. God damn right, I forgive them for that because I still bought it on the Wii U and on the three DS for ten bucks. You know, I'm such a bad fan. I have not yet bought it on the Wii U, only the 3DS. You but son I, of a bitch. <laughs> I still have my cartridge, though, so I don't know. I miss mine. I, that's that's one of the few things that, you know, over the years, you, you sell things for bills and for other shit, uh-huh. and I, I regret the Earthbound one every day. But maybe yeah. one day I'll get it back. You'll get it back. I believe in you. We got a shitload so, of money for it, though, so that was worth it. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, 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 so Toby the Secret Mine. Um, go play it. Um, if you can, you know, find it on a different system for cheaper, I mean, maybe go for that. Um, it does seem more like a Steam game than something I would consider a must-have for the PlayStation 4 because there's only one action button, and it's just, it's just standard platforming action, you know? Yeah. Well, okay, there's two action buttons. There's a jump and there's a flip switch button. So, I mean, you can handle that with a keyboard. True. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it when we covered it on on uh, Xbox. So it's good to hear that you enjoyed it as well. I just yeah, I, I don't get the the price difference. I don't know if it was just that difficult yeah. to pour it over, or I know sometimes you know there there was a price issue where it wasn't supposed to be that price and it might come down. Who knows? That we'll is <laughs> that is not for us to to judge and decide. But uh, yeah, we'll see when they yell at us. Maybe. <laughs> 
No, nah, the, the head up guys have always been good with us. So hopefully, you know, I'll, I might ask them in an email and be like, is there any reason why? And maybe they'll yeah, clarify. Yeah. Who knows? There you but, go. Uh, final game to talk about tonight is called The Tenth Line, developed and published by Sungazer Software. It released June 27th on the PS4 for twelve ninety nine. released back in March on Steam for nine ninety nine. a console RPG Featuring a colorful cast of characters, unique battle and level up systems, quick 2D platforming action, and an original fantastical story about friendship, faith, and finding your place in the world. Chris, what did you think of the 10th line? The 10th line, yes. Um, yeah, I needed an extra week with this one, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Do you tell. I. So I downloaded it. I was going to say I popped it in like a Super Nintendo cart, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I popped in the code and got the game. Close uh, enough. Yeah, close enough. So I started up and it, um, you know, I get to the screen. I'm like, okay, new game time. And they're like, you have three difficulties to choose from. And it's normal, easy, and very easy. And I'm like, oh, okay, so normal. You know, I'm a... I had beaten two Etrian Odyssey games. I am not afraid of any RPG. So <laughs> I, uh, I picked normal and started the game off. And basically, by the time the first hour had elapsed, I had done so many tutorials to get through the, the demo stage that like, I was like, I actually started another game just to go through all the tutorials again. Because <laughs> I was like, what all is going on here? But... And then um, the second time through, it's like, yeah, okay, I figured it all out. And then I got into doing all the things. And once I kind of got over the hump of, like, learning everything that's in this game, it it was really good. So I'll try and break down a few of these <laughs> just to uh, just to entice the, the people who like the complex system games. So, and plus, you know, it, it was largely, like, kind of drawing comparisons. So... The, the main part of the game, the action part of the game, is a side-scrolling platformer. And um, it's... Funny enough, there's only one game I know that does it this way that I personally have played. Um, so you run around this 2D platform uh, type thing, and the way you engage in battles is that there will be an enemy running around, and if you run into the enemy, then you have to fight them in a turn-based battle. Interesting. So... Yeah, so there's no like there's no real action RPG to speak of. It is a turn-based RPG, but one that involves uh, platforming. So the only other game that comes to mind where I've done this is a, a European only Game Boy Color game called Dinosaurus. Dinosaur apostrophe <laughs> us. <laughs> where you run around you run around as a little baby dinosaur and you try to find like basically the the boss in a platforming stage but you just randomly run into menu based battles that's so, so weird so it's like dinosaurus for all you dinosaurus fans out there oh yeah we we have the monopoly <laughs> on dinosaurus diehard fans because yes. you are on the show <laughs> Because I'm the one. You are uh, the dinosaur us fan. It is true. It is true. I will wake up the rest of the world to this game someday, though. Although uh, now but, I really do want to check it out. Yeah, you should. Um, okay, so the tenth line, though, to talk about the game we're talking about. Um, okay, so it's that. But the other thing is that okay, you have your three characters that meet right on the offset. Um, You've got the princess, who, as far as I played into the game, and I did play a couple hours into the game, is only known as the princess. Um, and then there's Rick, who is a... Uh, a well, Rick and uh, and Tox, who are both uh, beast men, quote-unquote. So a kind of um, anthropomorphic race that, um, you know, one of them is a fox who is a thief, and the other one is a dragon who is like uh, basically an old an old black mage kind of guy. Um, literally, he is a black dragon. So that's racist. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help what color he is. Um, so the princess is also a sword fighter, 
and she, for whatever reason, is the only one who can push uh, boulders around. So in the platforming section, you actually switch between these three characters and use their their map powers, that is to say, um, the princess who can push stuff, the thief who can throw stuff, and the dragon who can blow fire on stuff, or ice or poison. It gets you through various obstacles. And he's also the high jumper. So you have to use all three of their... Uh, their techniques in order to get through the stages, which that is a lot like the Lost Vikings. So it's kind of the Lost Vikings and kind of Dinosaurus. And so then, uh, when you actually get into these battles, they... Um, so the way it goes is that they put your characters on three different lines that are on the field. And also on those lines, directly in front of them, are three rows of enemies. And so your character, you choose the line that you're going to attack, and your character will attack it. And if it's a short-range attack, then if they kill the guy that's the first in line, then they're done attacking. But if they're attacking in a whole line, then they can attack all the people in that line. Or they can do a, a vertical line where they fight just the whole front row. Um, and you <clears throat> basically... Uh, the whole thing is set up with playing cards. Uh, that's how you choose your stuff. So, uh, once you pick your attack card, then it shows you your attacks that are available to use. Um, these attacks, basically, um, an amount of SP has to be gained, skill points, I guess. And you gain SP every turn. So, sometimes, you can't use all your moves every turn. You have to kind of build up a little bit. Yeah. But... So your first couple of moves might be a little weak, but then you build up to more powerful moves. And um, so then you utilize that. And those lines of enemies can actually go about 12 deep. So you could be fighting like 30 enemies in a battle. I mean, I didn't play that far, but that's the game promises that you can fight dozens of enemies at, at a time. <laughs> so, yeah, so it gets pretty crazy in that sense. And that part of the game... Reminds me of Mega Man Battle Network. Oh, and I love the Battle Network games. Yes, and it, it's very effectively, like, it captures that spirit of, like, okay, what attack is going to work best for this enemy placement? The strongest enemy's over there in the middle, so how am I going to get at him? And, like, you wind up strategizing in the same way that you would strategize in that game. So, <laughs> then you get into Towns... And uh, in your first town, you know, you're just there in the dead of night, so there's not really a whole lot of people to talk to. I think that's just so that they can give you that sort of you're not out of the woods yet sort of feeling um, because you're chased out of that town and into the next um, playing area. But in that town, then you start talking to people and you discover that on top of um, gaining, like, villager quests, like side quests... Um, which I want to say is a lot like Xenoblade Chronicles, only because that's what I'm currently playing on the 3DS. But it's not nearly that crazy. Like, Xenoblade Chronicles, you can get, like, ten quests per person in any town. <laughs> but um, but in this one, so the villagers give you um, quests. The other way that you can interact with them is by uh, playing a card game. And it's a card game that's almost exactly like the one in Final Fantasy IX. It's uh, You start off with a deck of player cards that are pretty strong, and they have numbers on the corners, and you have to like play them, and if somebody plays a higher card, then they capture your card, and if you play a higher card connecting to that, then it flips their card over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can actually win money and prizes this way, so it's not just useless like in Final Fantasy IX. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing has a triple triad. Well... Not quite triple triad. I guess it's that other one, but um, quad master was it or tetra master? Tetra master. That's the one. Thank you. Man, fuck that triple triad was so much better. Yeah, well, it, triple triad like that was that was Final Fantasy VIII's card yeah. game for who don't know. But didn't you win like actual prizes from that? Or you could win cards in the game. Okay, yeah. Same thing with Final Fantasy IX. There's no real consequence to winning or losing in this game. You can get really good items if you uh, win against, you know, high difficulty players. And it tells you their difficulty before you get into the game so that you don't wind up getting fleeced. Um, but I think the only thing you can lose is the money that you bet. 
so that's not too bad. I'm sure there are high stakes games later. So that gets me to the item system. <laughs> so the item system is uh, is also a little crazy, and this one took me quite a while to like really understand. So you gain items in the game. They're usually kind of like food products or basic supplies, and um, instead of using them like conventionally, like just you know selecting them in your item menu and then you know eating bread for health or something like that. Uh, you actually use them in your leveling up and skill gaining abilities. So here's how that works. You're, uh, you have a, it basically sets up all of your leveling up on a grid, which is a lot like Final Fantasy X. So the sphere grid system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. This game has so much stuff. So the sphere grid system is now in play. Uh, you start off on, it's not a sphere though, it's actually a flat, looks like kind of like a, the game of Sorry or a Monopoly board or something. So you start on one block, and you have all these different um, colored squares around you, like red, yellow, blue. And they each correspond to a certain stat that you can gain, which would be like blue for, um, I want to say it's HP, and then green for some other thing. Uh, red for attack. And so every time you gain a level, you can then move uh, your you can then move forward or in any direction on the board. But in order to fill in that sphere grid hole, like you have to use any item from your inventory, and every item in the game has an elemental af- affinity and a path. <laughs> so this is this is going to take a bit to describe okay so so uh, a weak item let's say it's a weak item and it's a red affinity and you've got a blue square that you want to fill out well you can do that but and because it's a weak item it will let you build a straight line across that square and because it's not the same color you won't get much of a stat bonus for filling it in but you can do it and then move on and you know, what you're trying to do is move, fill in the squares in order to move over to a skill, which will be on a set part of the board. And if you get to that skill, then you gain that skill. And it's another attack card that you can use in battle. Um, so, but if you use a more advanced item, um, then it might have like a cross. So that means that once you build onto the adjacent, the square right next to you, you can then either build another square on top, on bottom, or to the you know other direction um, of that square. And then that gives you more um, flexibility on where you can move your next uh, piece. And if it's the same color as the square, then you gain extra stats. So what you want, end up doing is item hunting for items that are rare, which makes them more powerful. They all have a rarity rating, of course. <laughs> and... You want it to be rare and have a lot of directions that you can move, and you want it to be the same color as the next square that you're going for um, in order to get the best results. Otherwise, you can just, you know, build them across and just try and get the skills, and maybe your character won't, you know, end up being uh, that powerful. But you can go back and actually replace the items, I think. I believe I did that. Um, So, you know, you can kind of build your character as you go along. (laughs) But that's the way that you gain levels and gain skills. So all of this, um, in learning this and getting through the first area and through the first town, took me like two and a half hours. Wow. <laughs> and that's all that stuff, yeah. And then by the time I got into the next area, it was introducing support characters, which are characters that can kind of help you out in battle by... Um, taking several turns to build up like one of two super moves they can sort of jump in and help you with, but they don't have any part of the platforming. So that's the the next thing I was learning by the time uh, all my, uh, you know, things had elapsed. So that, all that to say, um, I haven't even touched on like the story or the characters or anything. And honestly, I don't even feel the need to. However, if you're into story and characters, this one is actually really well written. 
I um, I was getting quite enthralled with it, and I thought I wouldn't be because I thought, okay, well, the characters are real out there because you got animal people and uh, uh, an obviously spoiled princess who's, you know, just going to fall under a whole bunch of tropes and stuff. But then when characters started talking, I was like, oh, okay, actually, this is really interesting, so I'm going to give this more of a chance. Um, the cool thing is all that stuff I just said about the game you could just completely toss aside by putting the game in very easy mode. <laughs> because if you just want to see the story of the game, you can literally cut out all encounters, um, all all the like necessity of gaining any kind of level. You can basically skip all the items and just run from, you know, do the platforming sections the way you're supposed to and then just go to the next area. Like the game gets that easy if you want it to. Wow. And I was actually, yeah, I was actually like, this is kind of cool because um, maybe I don't really want, like, maybe I want to look ahead and see what's, like, actually out there before I, like, commit myself to sitting here for an hour trying to win every card game and, you know, picking out items to put in spear grids and, like, training up my characters. I didn't even get into training up the characters. I'm not even going to because it's running <laughs> long. <laughs> There's, let's just say there's a whole nother layer and it involves the items as well. Uh, bottom it, it, line, it sounds like this is just a ridiculously deep game with influences from all over the RPG spectrum. Yeah, that's a very good summary that I was just about to get to. <laughs> <laughs> Beat you to it. <laughs> yeah. No, you did fine. Um... Yeah, but I just really like that uh, if I want to, I can just read the story or I can get really, really involved in the gameplay, which honestly is is entertaining to me. I love getting into systems. So it really is like this action RPG that I think is for the more amounts of audiences than the usual RPG. It's not, it's like it can get intimidating if you want it to. And certainly if you start a normal game off the cuff, then it's, it, it it has the light mode, which actually I haven't even tried, so I don't know what's in it. But I will say, like, it's got those levels of, like, of casual to um, getting really into the systems. And then I'm sure that there's some kind of hard mode in there, too. Because the game seems set up for it. The battles get really challenging. I was pretty impressed with that, actually. <laughs> hmm. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not at all the kind of game you can just push, you know, push the cross button and get through. Yeah. So... So I, I feel like I shouldn't even need to ask this, but for twelve ninety nine, what is your verdict on this one? Yeah, definitely get it for twelve ninety nine. Um it's it's a game that I feel uh could easily go for twenty and be just as good. Um for a download game that is to say if it had a physical release I would actually buy it. Um and the last point I swear this is the last point. Uh the soundtrack the soundtrack is gorgeous. It's really, really pleasant. It's very um, acoustic, and um, it's very, like, kind of subtle. I don't know. It's, like, it's got... It It adds a great feel to the game. It's not um, It's not overly orchestral. It's, uh... But it's very pleasing. Like, just the opening, the opening title screen is a great little song. Nice. And if uh, if anybody picks it up on Steam for nine ninety nine, I know that they have a DLC bundle that is the soundtrack and a digital art book for five bucks. Yeah, get those. Get so, that soundtrack. I have no idea if the soundtrack's available elsewhere. I might have to look that up. I I googled it. That's the only thing instance I saw of it. Just it's not like on Bandcamp or anything, but maybe Damn. it'll show. Maybe it will show up. I'm going to look for it. Oh, actually, no, I've already found it. I found it on YouTube, so I'm going to post it in my club. <laughs> that works. Yeah. Probably coincide with this, this podcast release, so look and, forward to and, that. And uh, what club yeah. is that on Facebook that you like? Being? Oh, it's it's called Hidden Sound Test Obs- um, Obscure Video Game Music. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I only built the club. It's only the most popular thing on Facebook. Yeah, it's just called Hidden Sound Test Obscure Video Game Music. Um, you know, go join. It's it's just people um, posting obscure music via Facebook or Bandcamp um, all day, every day. We don't do anything else. We don't allow people to do anything else. Yeah, no discussion, uh, no stupid, just post music. 
obscure so music. If, if you want to discuss something, just make sure there's music in the post. Yeah, or it'll exactly. delete it. So. Sounds good. Well, Chris, thank you so much for covering these games. I know you're going to be back on uh, eventually. I don't know how soon, because Pretty I know soon. your your next task is a biggie. Oh yeah, well that one is going to be pretty big. Um, but I also have that uh, that Chemco game you just sent me. Indeed, but uh, so I'm I'm, I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking RPG Maker. I'm very excited to see what you can do <laughs> with that. I'm I'm excited too. I've been messing around with it, so I'm gonna get serious about it and start building some stuff. Sounds good. Definitely keep me updated. And uh, do you have any any final words to end this episode? Um.